So I don't know if all of our listeners know this. I have a feeling a lot of you don't. But we have a really thriving community of post-Christian strugglers, overcomers, speakers, listeners, grievers, comforters, consolers, lovers. Really, really wonderful people that share their stories, needs, wounds, um, memes, kind of whatever regarding their process of leaving church. There were a few months of this podcast where only Brady and I got to hear these stories when people would write us privately. We decided it was pretty selfish for us to keep these amazing people and their stories to ourselves, so we started a secret Facebook group where people could be totally themselves and be totally honest about their struggle with leaving Christianity without having to worry about that incessant bombardment of Christians trying to argue, gaslight, shame, reconvert, etc., We call it the life after discussion and community. You have to be invited or added to the group. You won't find it by searching. It's a secret group for a reason. No trolls allowed, no apologetics, no proselytizing. No one on the outside even needs to know you're in the group. It's meant to be a safe space to rest as you process your deconversion. There are a little over 200 members right now and I'm blown away every day by the resilience these people demonstrate. It's a community in the truest sense. We laugh together. We cry together. It's a community in the truest sense. We laugh together. We cry together. Sometimes we come out together as queer or trans or as atheists or liberals. It's really turned into a beautiful space. If you're interested in joining, you can message us on our public Facebook group and we can add you. Or get a hold of us on our website or by email, as long as you have a Facebook profile. Christians are welcome too. We have a few of those as long as you aren't behaving in a way that's contrary to the purpose of the group and are willing to respect the variety of views represented. Which leads me to one of the themes of this episode, something we haven't talked about enough, but is one of the most common aspects of leaving the faith, spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse, or religious abuse, is a kind of abuse that hides under the guise of religious guidance or advice, or probably most often discipline or correction. Almost everyone experiences this at some point in the process of leaving religion. Maybe your church friend or your pastor or your Aunt Beverly gives you a lecture about how you're betraying God, but that he's still faithful, or that you need to repent of your doubt, or how sad it is that you can't see how sinful you're being. But obviously, it isn't always about leaving the faith. I don't think I know of a single queer person who has had to come out to a church or religious family who wasn't shamed for being honest about who they were. This kind of abuse can also be sneaky and subtle because it usually comes mixed with some kind of consolation or encouragement. It's often difficult to distinguish from helpful religious counsel, even for the abuser, which is why it's so dangerous and pervasive. The point is that your perspective is invalidated. Your ability to reason or act as an individual is challenged or taken away. We literally hear stories about this every day. It's sad. It's frustrating. It's infuriating. But that's why we're here, isn't it? We each need each other, podcasters and listeners, apostates and doubters. Together, we can create a voice loud enough to hear over the noise of religious abuse. Our guest today is one of those voices. Chris Stroop has a powerful presence as an ex-evangelical. He has started several successful hashtags on Twitter that have given former evangelicals an outlet for their frustration with the state of the church, including hashtag you don't know evangelicals and the explosive hashtag empty the pews. He has written extensively about the history and inner workings of the evangelical political machine and has been featured on Salon, Playboy.com, and of course his own blog entitled Not Your Mission Field. When we get back, our interview with Chris Stroop. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, You mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. 
How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> Welcome back. This is Brady, and I'm here with... Uh, Chuck Parson. And our guest today, who has been called the unofficial online elder statesman of the ex-evangelical... <laughs> Online community, Chris Stroop. Uh, he's got more titles <laughs> yeah. than Daenerys, Daenerys Targaryen. I, I messed that joke up really bad. But Chris, Daenerys say hello Targaryen. to our guest. Hello. Thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. Yes, thank you um, for being on the show. Now, Chris, I, I first learned who you were through Twitter, uh, because I think whenever we first started our show, uh, you had tweeted us at some point. And I saw that you were a verified Twitterer. <laughs> what what the yeah, hell, yeah. man? Um, so, yeah, how that happened more or less was that um, I had about maybe around 700 followers, I think, before the election. So even still into November, like I don't think I had broken 1,000 Twitter followers. I was mm. starting to use Twitter more to try to promote some of the work that I was doing uh, I didn't have my own blog up yet, which is at chrisdroop.com and called Not Your Mission Field, but I love that um, title. I, I published things with, uh, thanks. <laughs> right. I published things with religion dispatches um, most frequently, but also some other outlets. And I was using um, Twitter more to connect with the growing ex evangelical community. And um, after the election, I really blew up. I got a lot of Twitter followers, and that had to do with. Um, two things, I guess, is that I come from the Christian right and have written about and am critical of the Christian right. You know, that's my background. At the same time, I'm a credentialed expert, PhD in Russian history. I spent the years 2012 through 2015 uh, living in Moscow and teaching in a Russian university. And I had begun to study the contemporary connections between um, Russian church and state actors and the European and particularly American right. And so the ties between the yeah. Christian right and Russia, and you have this whole Trump Russia thing going on. Yes. Uh, I'm able to explain a lot of the context for that. And so that's what really caused me to take off. And when I learned that you could apply for verification, I don't even remember exactly when I did it, probably late November or sometime in December, uh, I had enough of a presence and uh, I guess uh, enough followers that um, they verified me. Cool. So the more our world went to hell, the more popular you became. <laughs> yeah, you could say that my very strange uh, life trajectory has prepared me for such a time as this. Cool. Oh my God, you're Good. like Esther. So, wait, wait, wait. how many... Uh, <laughs> at, oh God, Brady, Jesus. Uh, the only book of the Bible that doesn't mention God, which is really interesting. Um, yeah, it was written by a woman. Actually, so, so really, he is Esther, because he's not really... I don't think he's interested okay, in mentioning go. God. Well, there hasn't been a beauty contest involved, and I unfortunately would probably lose if there were. <laughs> I don't know, oh, I don't know, man. You have some beautiful hair, Chris. Yeah, come on. That, that, oh, that hair is on point. Um, <laughs> That's sweet of you. We, <laughs> we're really good at this. Now, <laughs> so uh, to put it in perspective, how many how many followers do you have now at this point, but give or take? Twenty five thousand. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, Damn. Right. So, uh, so Chris, uh, part of the, sort of sort of the reason, one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on the show is this. Uh, you've you've recently become more Twitter famous for this uh, hashtag <laughs> empty the pews, right? That's sort of taken off. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a, that started what like a month and a half, two months ago, probably. Yeah, uh, it, ha it started um, right after the whole Charlottesville thing, um, right. the Nazis with their torches and all of that, and the um, so-called president's not very effective. Well, maybe it was effective, not very good immoral response to that whole thing. Uh, and, you know, he was immediately defended by his uh, evangelical hangers-on, or they kind of tried to ignore it. Or then, like, Jerry Falwell Jr. later yeah. tweeted, that, oh, Trump is so, is so anti-racist, isn't that great? Or something like that. Right, you know, he's right, like, right. He's Just uh, really he's like, no, you guys. Like, um, <laughs> right. no, Jerry Falwell. 
saying that there are some very fine people among the Nazis and doing this kind of, kind of what about is in both sides them is not a robust denunciation of white supremacism. I'm sorry. Right, it's not. Right. Actually, I'm, actually, I'm not sorry about that. No, no, is. sorry, not sorry, right. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Chris tweeted, this was, uh, this was August 16th, he said, uh, if you left evangelicalism over bigotry and intolerance, or this election specifically, please share your story with the hashtag... Hashtag empty the pews. Um, and that's, yeah, that's and sort that of, really did take off. Yeah, 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 which I think is great. I mean, like, I, I you know, I feel like we needed it at that point, right? Yes. Because uh, there's this huge evangelical sort of Christian presence that is so bent on getting rid of abortion that they'll literally mm. sacrifice every other, like, moral, you know, presupposition or, you know, they'll they'll sacrifice, they'll they'll uh, compromise their position on any moral in order to like achieve that goal, right? And Trump is like yep. sort yep. of and one so- on the premise of, of of fulfilling that, and that's what it seems to be what's powering the movement, you know. And it's so obviously not even really about abortion; it's about power and control. Right. Abortion serves uh, for them as a kind of rallying cry, and I would argue that in a kind of Lacanian sense. It's a, it's a fetish. It's a defensive fetish. It's a kind of extreme manifestation of a psychological wow. defense mechanism. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Definitely. And, yeah. and there's a lot of I mean there's a lot of interesting things that you can um, pull out of that. If you kind of think about this evangelical anti-abortion craze um, through a Lacanian and Freudian lens. I mean, for example, why are they so concerned with unborn babies uh, or fetuses, we should say more technically, that, and they're not concerned with people who are already alive? Right. Well, you know, a fetus is never going to talk back to them. A fetus is totally safe. It's a, it's a blank cipher. They can project onto it exactly what they want, right. just in the same way they project onto God exactly what they want. Whoa, and okay. then they can claim to be open-minded. They can say things like, well, I don't hate gay people. But abortion, you know, that's how, <laughs> in a Lacanian analysis, that's right. how you identify a, a defensive fetish. It's like, I want you to let me off the hook for all my shitty stuff because of this. Like, wow. I'm not a bad yeah. You I feel know, like you've thought about this before. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you, might, you might say that. I have a slight morbid obsession with um, the Christian right and with religious ideology. And um, in terms of my PhD work in Russian history and where I've taken it since, I've also worked on religious ideology and the history of modern religious thought, particularly in its political and social aspects. So oh, when I went to like, study these Russian religious philosophers of the early 20th century, that many people kind of put on a pedestal. I mean, many people in the world of people who pay attention to early 20th century Russian religious philosophers. <laughs> which, is, which is the <laughs> all, most people. All of us, yeah, whenever yeah, we get bored. Everybody. Isn't, like a, isn't like a massive world, but typically like the people who study these guys really uh, think the world of them. Okay. And they tend to kind of push off to the side the more problematic aspects of their thought, and they want to pretend that you can have this beautiful metaphysics uh, without the terrible social conclusions, okay, and yeah, I don't yeah. think that you can. So what I did was I studied how they responded to the First World War as public intellectuals. I looked at their patriotic uh, speeches, activities, pamphlets, um, newspaper articles, and just this wild apocalyptic stuff that they said that like okay yeah yeah Russ was called by God to um, defeat Germany. So Russia's embodying Christianity in this scenario. Germany is embodying modern godless atheism, and through defeating oh, right. Germany, by rising to fulfill its calling, if it can purify itself enough to do so, you oh. know, then Russia will restore the Christian roots of European civilization. <laughs> with that, and I was like. These guys that, are early 20th century Russian Pat Robertsons. Like, <laughs> wow, yes, 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 yes. If so you we, get past that very heady metaphysical um, fin de siècle Russian idiom, and of course I'm bringing these sources in the original language, uh, once you get past that, I'm like, wow, this is really familiar. But then the other move that I made was to, um, to link that to their broader theological project and sort of try to say to everybody who wants to just pretend we can sweep this kind of stuff aside that actually, no, here's chapter and verse for why this flows very logically from this Christian worldview uh-huh. that yeah, yeah. they 
developing in philosophical terms. You cannot separate these things. Being a uh, being a, a post evangelical in the academic world is like is like a really valuable skill set, right? Because you, <laughs> I noticed this when I was in college. Like I uh, and I'm I'm working on going back, but uh, you like you have perspective. Like these authors and philosophers and and you know historical figures have this Christian perspective that they're working into their work and not a lot of people notice it. But when you're like, you've been immersed in Christian culture, you're like, oh yeah, no, I, yeah, I definitely see it. You, you see know? how this mm-hmm. works from the inside. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really mm-hmm. interesting. Actually. So, Chris, yeah, when, yeah, that too. when did kind of the evangelical uh, in America, evangelicals in America become so obsessed with, with abortion? Was there, can you kind of pin that down to a specific time and reasoning? Sure. Um, so it's it's a 70s and 80s thing, and I didn't even immediately rally to it for the most part right after Roe. It took, it took a little while. Um, they were trying to organize politically. You know, Jerry Falwell was um, one of the big movers and shakers. They were trying to unite people across yeah. different denominations and mobilize for for politics. And so previously, they had really been mobilizing around um, a couple of things, certainly uh, racial segregation, which is a part of their history that they have tried to erase, but mm-hmm. that was a big, a big part of when they started uh, founding Christian schools and that sort of thing in the 60s, even though this took off more in the 70s and even more in the 80s. Uh, in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, those early Christian schools were founded as segregation academies to avoid uh, racial integration. And then, of course, mm-hmm. you have the big Bob Jones case and the big think about that. Right. And at a yep. certain point, this becomes uncomfortable for them to uh, to have to overtly defend white supremacism. Um, oh, the other thing, the really, other thing of course, was 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 parent schools. Um, so abortion becomes a new rallying cry. But even in in the early 1970s, for most evangelicals, that was still sort of a Catholic thing, and they they mm-hmm. weren't going to think about it that much. Interesting. Were you going to say, Chuck? Uh, no, I was going to add real quick. I don't. I don't know how widely known the the Bob Jones uh, case is. Mm. Can you can you like briefly like break down what happened there? Because I I'm like f- somewhat familiar with it, but you know. Yeah. Well, so, I feel like it's um, it's pretty telling, right? Yeah, it drag. It was a, a case that dragged on for a long time. So. Basically, um, you know, religious not-for-profits, they don't have to, they, they have these uh, tax exemptions. And um, the case was over whether Bob Jones could proscribe interracial dating and interracial marriage and still be tax exempt. And I'm off the top of my head, we're going to have to look this up off the top of my head. I can't remember the exact years that this case was litigated, um, but eventually they did lose that case i think that didn't happen though until the 1980s okay and um there were similar things going on at the same at the same time um changes in in the evangelical world um christian schools started to take off more and more so that and the homeschooling movement as well became a big thing yeah uh, really really wave. started started to get big in the 80s yeah uh, yeah based on these earlier precedents and um, you know, in the early 80s, you could still be Jimmy Carter and be a Southern Baptist in good standing, right? Right, yeah. No, yes, yeah. So, social justice and, and Christianity still went together then. <laughs> like, not yeah. so much anymore. And so, an, an, another sort of thing where we see changes happening, particularly uh, in the 80s, would have to do with uh, fights between the Southern Baptist Convention and the other Baptist denominations that were part of this Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, uh, which you have to kind of understand in the context of the Anabaptist tradition um, going back further into history. They really had a very robust uh, belief in the importance of the separation of church and state because it keeps the church from being corrupted by the state. That right. was the more mainstream Baptist position um, into the 70s and 80s, but throughout the 80s, the Southern Baptist um, Convention is becoming more and more uncomfortable with this approach, and they want to get more directly involved in political mobilization. And finally, at some point in the early 90s, they cut off all funding and all ties with the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty, which still mm-hmm. exists. Okay. But, you know, Interesting. But now, okay. but now the hardcore radical Southern Baptists are sort of your typical American Baptist. And the vast majority of white evangelicals in the United States would qualify as fundamentalists by an academic definition of the term. I was one of those Southern Baptists, Chris. Ugh. 
<laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. My uh, condolences. It's so yeah. you're right. I'm I'm very sorry, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> that part of hey old brady can't cut the phone right now because he's dead all right <laughs> right that's, that's very true <laughs> yeah. um well cool well, damn so how what were you what were you when you grew up like what uh denomination uh because you were definitely inside of the evangelical craze yeah so i'm a christian i'm a christian school kid from um first grade through half of sixth grade i went to heritage christian school in indianapolis then in seventh and eighth grade, I went to Colorado Springs Christian School in Colorado, and that was 1993 to 1995, and um, that was precisely the period when Colorado Springs was transformed into the horrible Christian right dystopia that it is now. Okay. Did you take a field uh, trip to focus on the family? We didn't, but oh, wow. I wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have been surprised if we. I mean, right, everyone right. there was like really yeah, big actually, into. The- yeah, I'm a little disappointed because yeah, because I, I went there. I saw Wits End, the whole mm. thing. Yeah. In was, our church, we had uh, some people who worked for Focus, including like one at that time high-ranking Focus executive. His name was yeah, Kurt Leander. Okay. Um, we were at this church called Community Church in the Rockies. My dad was the music pastor, and oh, it was wow. in the missionary church denomination. Okay, um, okay. But before that, in my childhood, I mean, I guess the first church that we went to was also a missionary church in um, a tiny town in northern Indiana where I was born, and then... Okay. Just before I was five years old, we moved to a north suburb of Indianapolis called Fishers. And um, there we went to a Baptist church for a while, a Wesleyan church for a while. And then in 1991, we were in an independent Christian church, and my dad had become the music minister. So when I was born, he was a high school band director. And then he was just doing freelance uh, arranging, composing, studio work, sound engineering, um, producing and that kind of stuff for various. So um, you were like a, you were sort of a PK light. I was about to, yeah, PK. (laughs) You were like, uh, you were like your church, your family's life sort of revolved around the church. Like your dad worked there and you were probably there all the time. Yeah. You could, you could, you you could say that. You weren't a PK in the, in a strict sense, but, but there was some. Not like my dad was the head pastor. No. And he also wasn't like a, a pastor throughout my whole childhood, but from fairly, Early on, I mean, so from when, from the time that I was eleven years old, he was okay, cool. Primarily employed in churches, and he had a little bit more of um, a foot in the secular world than the rest of us because he continued to um, do all of this studio work and have involvement with like the local and also national um, music community. You know, songwriters, sound engineers, producers, and musicians. Right. So he wasn't but, legalistic in the sense that all the music had to be Christian or worship no, or anything like that. Okay. No, he wasn't, but we did have mostly contemporary Christian music at home and um with some exceptions. We also had like some show tunes and Yes. <laughs> uh I had some of my parents' old records, by which I mean vinyl records, and we still had an old working record player at that oh, time. Yeah. I got to have it in my room and so like I had this 1950s collection, 50s classics that my mom had. Yeah. So as this like 10 year old kid, I'd be rocking out to Johnny Be Good or. Right, all right, cool. You know, to Chuck Berry, Del Shannon and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. I love it. Um, but other than that, we had mostly contemporary Christian music okay. around. Uh, my dad, like, he, he personally knows people like Gray Bolts and Sandy Patty. Oh, oh my God. Ray Bolts yeah. anchor holds the hair that I just imagined in my brain. Is <laughs> yeah, remarkable. actually, if you think about it, like, Cindy Patty and Ray Bolts kind of had similar. They hairdos. really did. Like That's I, true. I, yeah, I almost like merged their two figures together the into a hair. super into a Frizier. super group. You know, <laughs> a Christian. I mean, it was like it person. was a good era for that kind of hair. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was. Maybe yeah. that was not quite the style Ray of music Bolts. that we usually associate. Cindy Patty had a joint album with Gerbert, the puppet. And that's what my grandma listened to every time I was in a car with her. Um, I would just like to say that I used to work at a Christian bookstore, me and I have too. so many good stories from we, that. Yeah, yes. Brady, both we, me and Brady, exchanged. We did have an episode of just a um, Christian bookstore. Episodes. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I had a Ray Bolt's cover of "Proud to Be an American" on a track. <laughs> really? Yeah, like a like, like a the track lead, where the they would English take out song? the where they would take out the oh, words and you oh, could just sing. sing. Yeah, yeah. So churches do this thing. If anybody has not been a part of this where you if you don't have a full band you get 
music performance tracks, tracks yeah. performance oh, yeah, tracks yeah, yeah, sure, and absolutely. you just put in the, you put it in the church cd player and play the music and then the the people that sing sing along with the music so it's like really rough christian karaoke if there if you can imagine a worse <laughs> thing than that i'll pay you it's like a half uh, step saying, up over so a wait a minute final. wait a minute your congregation sang lee greenwood in church I'm pretty sure there oh, was. Of course. I'm pretty sure there was a, a Ray Bolts "Proud to Be an American." And I remember picking it up and thinking, "Why? Like, why does this? Why is this real? Why is this real?" Every Fourth of July, our church would get a American flag that they borrowed from a gas station because it was big enough to cover the stage. It was probably made in China. Probably, yeah. <laughs> probably. But it was so big that it fit. I, I went China, to a mega church, China. and so like it was a huge ass stage. But they had the flag would come down in the middle of God oh, Bless America, and yeah. we had pyrotechnics, and then all the ser- oh. all the service people would walk down the aisle in their uniforms. And, oh wow! Uh, Chris, the Holy so, Spirit at that moment. Let me just tell you. <laughs> so um, um, I don't remember <laughs> us ever singing that God awful song in church, but. In Christian school, our elementary school talent shows, we would end with a sing-along of it. So I still experienced it in an evangelical context. And I, want to, I want to hear I was, about that. Um, we do need to take yeah, a, a quick break, was, though. Um, okay. When we get back, um, Chris, I want to hear more about you growing up Christian. And I want to hear about this fucking talent show. This sounds amazing. <laughs> and um, also, I want to hear about your transition outside of Christianity. Uh, we'll get to that right after this. Extra, extra, read all about it. Why are you trying to sell a newspaper on our podcast? I'm not. I'm telling our listeners about the blog. Did you know that the podcast is only one of the themes that we produce? Yes. We also have a blog on thelifeafter.org, posts about starting over after religious trauma. But don't you think you're being a little extra? I am extra. And you can read all about it on thelifeafter.org. But um bum uh, Chris, when we left off, we were talking about your school's talent shows. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what other things from your schooling um, really stuck out to you as kind of what I would call um, under the genre of bizarre evangelical? I mean, there was our, our sort of Christian fake sex ed, I guess you could say. Oh, and, um, yeah, that's important. <laughs> in sixth, <laughs> what in sixth kind grade, of we had a program called um, Creating Positive Relationships, CPR. And the thing that stuck with me most from that was they were sticking and unsticking some Velcro half hearts together and telling us that if you stick and unstick Velcro too much, it stops being sticky. And also the phrase, the underwear zone. What? Okay. Wait, okay, so first of all, uh, the whole purpose of Velcro is that you can stick it and unstick it as many times as you want, and it works fine. Yeah, that's officially from uh, NASA's website. I don't know. Yeah, that's from, that's NASA right there. Uh, we, tape is a much better example, which is the one I got, but uh, we'll go with Velcro. Okay. I think it was Velcro. I mean, you know, this was yeah. like six. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I mean, if you get enough crap in Velcro, it doesn't work. <laughs> so How do you the, use purity, the purity culture stuff does stand out to me and, it, yeah, and I, that's, it was something yeah. that was traumatizing um they also have like submit questions privately the things that people wanted to ask about and so of course somebody asked like well how far is it appropriate to go with your girlfriend or boyfriend oh, the, the age and old so, question yeah so they shamed they like shamed the whole class for the fact that anyone even asked that question really? and then yeah, they wow. were like, you shouldn't be thinking about that at all. You should be trying. You don't. You shouldn't be asking about where the line is. You should be trying to stay as far back as possible. But if you really yeah. have to know where the line is, then anything that falls into the underwear zone is totally off limits. And by that, they, they meant anything that would typically be covered by underwear. Yeah. So they gave me the phrase "the underwear zone," for which. Thank you. And then um, <laughs> it sounds like a Star Trek theme of like where the Vulcans uh, and the I smell humans a good, aren't I smell a to. hashtag coming. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah. In um, in seventh grade, then they did another fake sex ed thing. Oh wait, I forgot to say though that sixth grade program, well that I had in sixth grade called CPR for creating positive relationships, abstinence only sex education program in Indiana still exists, and I googled it not too long ago, and oh, I saw that they're in, like, no. a bunch of central Indiana public schools. No. Is, uh, uh, see, that's a big thing that we're, we're running into here in St. Louis, and I'm part of a Facebook group for um, where there's, like, a an abstinence-only group going on, and they're trying to defend it. But then, like, in their emails, they're saying all of this stuff about, like, 
God and how this is the only way for, you know, God's glorification. And they're like, oh, we're not a religious, we're not religious. And it's like, <laughs> wait, hold on a second. How do you, how do you justify your, 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 the way you're communicating about God then, you know? And yeah, we get, we get all kinds allowed? of, all kinds of shitty hard right Christian propaganda into American public schools. I mean, let's face it. America's got some pretty stupid policies. Right. Yeah. About, yeah, yeah. About, but you about didn't get things. away from any of this because you went to a private high school and, and private schooling as well, correct? Yeah. So uh, in seventh grade and eighth grade, I was at Colorado Springs Christian School in um, Colorado Springs, Colorado, as you might guess from the name. And um, it was even more extreme than Heritage Christian School in Indianapolis. So at that school, I remember getting a worksheet in seventh grade Bible class that like basically said, you know, it showed like it had like a little sort of like map pointing to where um the descendants of noah went and basically said that um oh, no. black people are the cursed descendants of ham no. uh, oh, yeah. oh, our, our bible teacher kind of looked embarrassed when he handed this one out as far as i remember but he made us do it i guess he was probably thinking like this is in the workbook we're doing everything in the workbook so here you guys go Wow. Um, I don't, what a renegade. I don't think that I don't think that we had a single African American student in that school though. Right. I no, sure don't of course. ever seeing one. But um in in at Heritage Christian I School. Hope in not. Athens, I mean imagine how that kid would feel. <laughs> yeah, going getting that asked, curriculum that would actually, be the worst. But I have talked to African Americans who like got the whole curse of ham thing <laughs> in predominantly white evangelical churches. Yeah, so yeah, like yeah does happen oh no, um, yeah, it's definitely hard, does. It's awesome. hard and, it, yeah. and at heritage christian school we did have um, like a small number of people of color and it has since become much more integrated at this point um so that's yeah interesting but so in Colorado yeah. springs as well we also did another fake sex ed thing in seventh grade where we had like a retreat and i'm putting that in like giant air quotes because it's okay. a really dumb thing to call a retreat <laughs> so you know they basically took us somewhere and then separated the boys and the girls for separate shaming and fear-mongering sessions, right. which were basically like, you know, all about how uh, horrible, horrible diseases can happen to you. Oh, and yeah, pray, yeah. Pray for your future spouse, and oh my God, you know, you should stay as far away as possible from any sort of physical intimacy until you're married. And hey, we have these purity pledges. Would you like to sign them? Hint, it's not really optional. You're right, so, <laughs> right, right. Um, so obviously um, they did not say hint, it's not really optional, but that was the message <laughs> that you got. They were like, okay, everyone now go sit somewhere by yourself and really pray about this. And if you feel like you can commit to it, sign this purity pledge. But among ourselves, we uh, kind of like, we weren't sure if we would get expelled if we didn't uh, sign them. Right. So we were totally coerced into signing purity pledges and that was horrible. Um, so disgusting. you look back on that now as a positive experience? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're really, i mean you know it, okay, uh, joke. that was a great one right you know what's <laughs> scary to me is i recently found in my basement um this notebook i can't believe i'm talking about this right now i found this notebook that i found i started writing letters to my future spouse when i was 16 years old oh no and, it's, oh, it's wow. a, and so every like few years I, I wrote into this notebook of like dear future wife and i would say all these things and like there was one thing that purity culture really messed with me, and that was that I did not want to be with somebody who loved me more than I loved God. And that was like a huge obsession oh, of mine, yeah, is yeah, that yeah. they would be more focused on God than they would be me. And you, you know, like, I mean, we talk about, I, I can talk for hours about how purity culture really fucked me up, but, you know, this had to do with just even intimacy of right. somebody. Mm-hmm. No, you that know, really sucks because right, and I struggle with it still. Of like, if somebody, if somebody is into me, my first response is to not trust them because oh, obviously something's no. not right with these people. Pretty and and number two uh, to like feel like they need to have their focus on something better than me, and then we can just kind of like, you know what I mean, like uh-huh. be each other's oh, secondaries know, yeah. to whatever. Is that more is important. so sad. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I have like these letters of just year after year of my life, starting at like, it might've actually been before 16. It might've been 14 or 15 of just these letters to my future wife. And um, uh, we'll be posting the video uh, pictures of those <laughs> in video. You were a better 14 year old Christian than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I gave them, I gave them to who became my wife and she just didn't really care that much. <laughs> <laughs> 
it was, did you give him to her <laughs> on her wedding night oh no oh brady yeah that's where everything went <laughs> i'm down. heartbroken with you i'm so <laughs> thank you guys thank sad. you for letting me hear that uh, <laughs> we'll share this really that's sad bullshit story. that you did that in the first place and it's even <laughs> worse that your that your ex-wife Rejection. did not uh yeah. did oh, not God embrace them with her whole heart i'm sorry uh, but if she did embrace with her whole heart, really, then I probably really would have been uncomfortable that, with it. I'm really right? glad that you're gay and not uh, doing that anymore. Yeah, I'm going to give it to my future husband. <laughs> <laughs> I really want you to love God that I don't believe in more than me. <laughs> I hope that's how that goes. Yeah. I hope we can worship God together. Question Maybe. Mark? Big question marks. <laughs> that's, what that's, that's what that really annoying thing with the, my voice is doing. Question right. Mark? Anyway. So Chris, um, so you, yeah, uh, that was, that was a, v- a very good snapshot of your of your Christian <laughs> upbringing. I'm sure there is so many more anecdotes we could get into, but uh, so yeah. you, you, very bizarre stuff from high school, including an apocalyptic sort of quasi mystic science teacher. Oh, oh I yeah, want to hear no, this. this. I want to hear that. Yeah, I feel like story. if it was a. Do you remember the uh, Left Behind movie? No, not Left Behind. The Hangman's Curse movie. I didn't see that. I didn't see Hangman's Curse. Oh, it was that a was... book. It was a book by Frank Pretty. I just feel like the character oh. that you're about to mention could have been played by Frank Pretty. <laughs> Continue. I'm sorry, because um, yeah, he yeah. put himself in his own movies because he's basically like, you know, Stephen King or something. Cool. Because he, he thinks he's because he thinks he's like a Christian Stan Lee or something. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's that's it. Um. So yeah, <laughs> there's this teacher at our school named Stephen Terry. He's also like, or at least he used to be, uh, like the weight coach that, for weightlifting okay. and. Um, he is the chemistry and AP chemistry and AP biology and physiology teacher. I think he still is. Um, so I had him for chemistry and AP biology in the 1990s, in the, um, late 1990s. And, uh, he would start class. This in itself wasn't that unusual in this school with like some kind of a devotional, but he would call his thoughts and they would just like, they would just like ramble on forever. And it was kind of trippy. He'd be like, so like I had this dream, and oh, I was before the white throne of judgment, and yes. Christ was separating everyone into the sheep and the goats. And I was wandering up and down and looking around, and I was so concerned to try to see if any of my students were among the goats. And I was so relieved when I found out that there were no students among the goats. And so he would do stuff like this, and he would literally go on sometimes. Oh, but my for students half. were among the. He really Basically, cared about Matthew you guys. Basically, Matthew twenty-five. Yeah. Well, he was saying that, like, he in his dream, he did see that there were none of us among the goats, so he was oh, happy. Oh, good. Who, okay. who is he oh, in this good. scenario? I'm sorry, not sorry, Mr. Terry, but now I'm an apostate. Um, right? So, yeah, so he would, like, he would go on like this, and sometimes it would take half the class time. Even in AP Biology, which was two class periods, sometimes, like, pretty much the whole first period would go to just these rambling, weird devotionals, which were often apocalyptic and about, like, dreams and visions and the holy spirit told him to do this like one time i was jogging and the holy spirit was like hey go talk to that person in that car oh, right 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 <laughs> yeah god wants you to say something to this person and um yeah just like weird stuff um and not teaching science like <laughs> 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 he did teach us I mean, science. Well, his job wasn't really to teach science anyway, let's be real. I don't <laughs> know. Science, I on the exam. science in a strict sense is not oh, really a thing at I Christian school. I got schools. a five on the AP biology exam, but Go, good work. not necessarily, like, not all thanks to him, I'm sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> we had, for AP biology, like, you have to use, like, a normal college textbook, you know? You can't use, like, a oh, Christian alt right, text. right. Okay, 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 Fake okay. That hel- yeah, that helps. AP, so, AP was your, your refuge, your safe you space. You have to use a standard, a standard <laughs> college technology <laughs> textbook. <laughs> but, um, no, it was definitely not an ever-present refuge. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so he did not teach us the evolution chapters, though. He was like, you should uh, read the evolution chapters on your own, and you should regurgitate them for the exam. Like, you should just write on the exam what you want to hear. But then he would also show us, like, flood geology videos and Creation Institute videos. Right, like, right, um, right. what was that guy's name? Dwayne T. Gish. Do you guys remember Dwayne T. Gish? I don't. No, uh, that you was know what? That, 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 like, vaguely rings a bell. Like, maybe I was exposed <laughs> once or twice, but... He made a big deal about the Bombardier Beetle and irreducible complexity. Like, how okay. there's no, yeah, yeah. there's no way that this beetle could evolve all these parts to like do right. this little fire thing out of its. Oh butt yeah, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Like bananas. Look at the human eye. Right. Bananas. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of bullshit. I don't know if um, 
if Dwayne T. Gish ever did the banana one. The banana one is particularly That's great. The banana cost. one is, is great. great. Can we actually, can you, I love the banana one because <laughs> bananas are a mutation. Every banana is genetically it's identical the yes. because they, because it's a mutation that happened once and somebody was like, these plantains taste really good. Let's make a whole bunch of them. But if there was ever a plague that wanted to take out all the bananas, all of the bananas in the world would be dead because they're genetically identical. And that is a terrible example because it's a great <laughs> example of evolution. It's an amazing example of evolution. In context, Ray Comfort this is what has happens. this whole spiel about bananas and about how they're perfectly curved and like they have their own wrapper. They and fit they, in your hand. Yeah, yeah that God made them specifically for people like, to eat. Right. Yes, and it's, opening them. And, and Kirk Cameron just and sitting there with him like, yeah, this yeah, is I like great. Bananas. I like bananas. bananas. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, like people in most countries open bananas from the opposite. Yes, end of and, the end. and they monkeys do. Yes, do. Yeah, and, and monkeys, monkeys do, do. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's just my favorite. That is my favorite Christian <laughs> apologetic argument ever, hands down. The but banana. Plenty Gish was like he was all about the um, creationism stuff and trying to debunk evolution and talking about how there's no transitional fossils and whatever. Uh, we also watched flood geology videos, so we were like being indoctrinated with this young Earth creationist mm. bullshit. But we were also doing lab work, doing like recombinant DNA, and we were supposed to transfer some genes that would make um, bacteria glow under a black light. And like our team didn't do very well, but hey, we were learning about genetics. <laughs> right, 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 definitely. <laughs> yeah. I, very, uh, I very specifically remember when I was a kid, there was a traveling uh, group, and I think it may have had to do with Ken Ham's bullshit. I'm not sure exactly what it was affiliated with, but they came into my uh-huh. church, and they, they had this seminar for homeschool kids, and I my mom actually let me stay home from school, which was like the only time that's ever happened. And in there, they taught us a lot of the young earth creationist bullshit. But also, there was a group in there that came in and said that they had seen Noah's Ark, that they actually took an expedition, that somebody on their group was struck with lightning, that they had all these pictures, but then they couldn't tell us exactly where it was because they lost the information and had all this bullshit. But they also went on about how there were dinosaurs in Africa and how they had seen them. But like they brought this into like our our mega church and tried (laughs) to use this as propaganda to teach us about young earth creationism about and the look, truth Brady? yeah about the truth but i look <laughs> back at it now and it just realized like how incredibly um irresponsible that was for my church mm-hmm. to have this this bullshit and to allow them to say that from our from the stage because even if if you're a christian you're evangelical you don't have to believe that that shit existed right. or that that it occurred that they really took an expedition and all of this but like they were feeding oh, yeah, us that shit. Feeding us. People do. I mean, that kind of stuff circulated yeah. in my environment too. We definitely were told and believed that um, that Noah's Ark had been sighted on Mount Ararat. They even had like yes. pictures of something that they were saying, like, "This is Noah's Ark. We found it. It's in Turkey, you guys." Yes. And it's just like sometimes the glaciers shift and you oh, can yeah, see totally. it. Oh yeah, totally. Sometimes the glaciers I, shift I and that. you yeah, can't yeah, see it. Definitely. And um, the stuff about how like human footprints and dinosaur footprints had so supposedly been found in the same layer. So see you guys, dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. Like, what are you talking about? Right. Also, right. there's not enough dust on the moon. And <laughs> I, I saw there was a, um, a couple atheists who Side took note. a, a couple of atheists <laughs> took a tour of John Ham or of Ken Ham's Noah's Ark thing. And in there, there's like a diorama of how in the olden days, one of the reasons that God punished, um, punished, the world is because they would feed believers to dinosaurs and have like this coliseum <laughs> of where they weren't being attacked by like uh, <laughs> lions or whatever, but there were actual I've dinosaurs. Seen that, I've seen that illustration. It's hilarious. It's Ken insane. Ham also, Ken Ham also blocked me on Twitter. Congratulations. Yay. We Mark have a, Driscoll yeah. has also blocked me on Twitter. Who did? Who did? Uh, Mark Driscoll. Yes. Or, uh, Mark Driscoll. We have a, we Jamie have a Lee pretty, Finch. Of, was yeah was our, blocked our by previous him guest Jamie uh, has also recently recently got blocked by Mark Driscoll and celebrated with a Facebook post yeah I just uh, got blocked by him yesterday because right. I, I um I started this like no Driscoll hashtag to yes. uh, protest the decision of Pathios to let Mark Driscoll have a blog on which he was already plagiarized yeah. again by the way work Th- Warren Throckmorton called him out on it it's hilarious Mark Driscoll it's terrible, terrible still exists I mean that that that's like a prime example like any if anybody should have had like a a political downfall. 
that should have been irredeemable. It's Mark Driscoll, but you know whatever. Jeez, could know. it be? Could he be a rich white narcissistic <laughs> man? <laughs> I don't know anything about that. We do have quite the obsession with white narcissists. Um, we do need to take a break. When we come back, um, Chris, I want to hear a little bit about what kind of got you out of Christianity, um, or what you were brought up with, at least, I should say, and uh, kind of what your transition out of that was. So we'll be right back right after this. The Life After Facebook page is a great way to get in touch with other religion survivors. Also, we like to post interesting articles on there. And it's a good way to get a hold of us. And you won't need a concordance to find us. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have a link to the Facebook page on our website, thelifeafter.org, or search The Life After on Facebook. Finally, you could just go to our URL, facebook.com slash thelifeafterorg. Chuck, will you welcome us back? Uh, welcome back to The Life After. We're here with Chris. Stroop. Buddy, Chris Stroop. Uh, Dr. Chris Stroop. Dr. Chris Stroop, Twitter extraordinary. You guys don't don't have to use the doctor. Yeah, I know. Most most doctors don't actually like the doctor, but we like to sort of we just like to do over it. accentuate. Hashtag it. empty the PhDs. Uh, so okay, Chris, real quick, real quick, before we get into this this last segment, uh, we never quite we got a little sidetracked. Never quite finished the story about your. Uh, your rapture uh, obsessed teacher, science AP teacher. biology teacher, yeah. played by Frank Pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't quite get to the funniest part about um, about Mr. Terry, who I had for chemistry and AP biology. And the funniest part is that both of those years, he he would um, at some point in the fall, at some point in September, he would go into his thought for the day, which is what he called his devotionals. And he would start <laughs> rambling about how it's clearly the year of Noah because sin is increasing in the world. And did you hear that they're genetically engineering red heifers so that they can <laughs> like purify the Temple Mount and rebuild the Temple? And um, <laughs> no, seriously. And okay. he would like conclude with, uh, he was pretty sure that the rapture was going to happen this fall around Yom Kippur. Okay. okay. Why Yom and Kippur? He, well, I guess um, there's I guess there's symbolism there. Yeah, there's there's a lot of significance. So if you uh, for um, Christians appropriating Judaism, you know how that works with the whole Christian Zionism thing <laughs> yeah. and the the theology of what we call supersessionism, uh-huh. right? So um, people who try to predict the rapture um, tend to put a lot of stock in the Jewish calendar yes. and Jewish holidays. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it just has to do with that. And the funny thing is, like, uh, most of the evangelicals that I grew up with were not. We they definitely thought we were living in the end times. They would always be talking about the signs that it was the end times. You know, wars and rumors of war, natural disasters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but they didn't try to put even a rough date on it because no one knows the day or the hour, right? They would quote that first. <laughs> but Mr. Terry, Mr. Terry like really believed he was very in tune with the Holy Spirit and he was perfectly fine with like, he wouldn't say exactly when. So I guess that's how he got around that no one knows the day or the <laughs> oh hour. No one knows the day or hour, but they might know the week or the month. <laughs> yeah, the general <laughs> vicinity of time. Um, so, so yeah, so two years in a row, you know, sin, sin is sin is getting so terrible in the world. Oh my God, yeah, tolerating yeah. gay people. You know, was the subtext there? <laughs> Red heifers, yeah, yeah, yeah. Heifers, year of Noah, Temple Mount. So I'm um, in conclusion. You know, Christ is probably going to come back around Yom Kippur this <laughs> fall. <laughs> That's so, a big uh, thing, you know, is that uh, the 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 sin is getting so bad, like as if we're living in the worst yeah, time in human yeah. history. You know. <laughs> people are, oh men are dressing as women and like oh my god, oh my god. it's so bad gay, it's okay to be gay and it's like you realize jesus literally lived in a time where like adult male mentors would have sex with their young male you know like uh, like students i guess you that's a different part of antiquity that you're referring to yeah, and, and uh, uh, self righteousness and uh, hypocrisy no, like temp- are the type of pro- sins that just kind of get glossed over in those sort right, of things, right, right. you know? Like, yeah, well, never mind. Also, like the whole idea that um, God destroying everybody except for Noah and his family is like perfectly just is kind of 
horrifying. Right. Oh, um, yeah, <laughs> but you, you used a phrase before that I, I loved, and that was um, rapture anxiety. Yeah, rapture anxiety is a thing. Um, I have, you know, since kind of like connecting to so much more of the ex-evangelical community and helping to bring people together and build that community in part through hashtags that we've, we've used to find each other, hashtags like uh, you don't know evangelicals, you might have grown up evangelical if uh, spiritual abuse is Christian alt facts uh, and eventually right. empty the pews. Um, I've heard a lot of people talk about just how very extremely afraid they were as children that they were going to get left behind. Um, yeah, so yeah. it's, I think, a pretty common experience. Uh, it's part of that sort of generally pervasive um element of abuse that is just there in the very uh, ideology and community of evangelicalism. And a lot of people were afraid of the rapture. So I personally did not experience, I don't think that was something, one of the things that really traumatized me. I do have religious trauma, but I don't remember being that scared about being left behind, like once in a while. Um, I did have thoughts like, but what if I never get to get married and have sex? You know, and then I felt guilty for having those thoughts. Oh, and, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once during a physics test, though, that when it was getting close to Yom Kippur, I was like, I'm not very ready for the physics test, Lord, so if you feel like it, like, you can go ahead and come back. <laughs> Yeah. Right. right, 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 yeah. A little bit of relief in the rapture. The thing rapture. that you just said about sex is interesting because I was like that too. I, I had one really bad episode of, of of rapture anxiety. I was... There was this family that babysat me. We were at the Lake Yozarks. We were in a boat. And I just had this idea that like, oh, for sure, this is the day that Jesus was going to come back. And I do specifically remember like being a little upset that I never got to, uh, you know. It's uh, it's interesting because it's, uh, it's our, you know, it's our fear of mortality. It's just another reason to fear mortality. Yeah. It's literally what that is, right? Like. What if I never get to have sex? That's a that's a fear yeah, like, that you yo, have. Yeah, like yo dog, I thought you like fear, so I put a fear in your fear. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> yeah. the exhibits of uh, of mortality. Like like a man and wife <laughs> asleep in bed. Um, she hears a noise and turns her turns head. Turns his and she is gone. <laughs> right, thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> All of you. Okay, so Chris, what other kind of like spiritual trauma really sticks out? You mentioned that you have experienced that um and i think all of us have in our listeners what was kind of one of the main things that stuck out in your head sure um so i guess i would say that this is really related to when i i guess i started my process of deconstruction and i started to have a kind of serious crisis of faith and to really wrestle with doubts i mean i'd always asked some of the hard questions i think there'd always been some doubts in the background and i while I lived in an evangelical enclave community, you well, know, we all have entire, doubts. We all yeah. have moments where we question, you know. Sure. But it's just a matter of wrestling with God and realizing, you know, that His word is true. Right. I mean, one of Ugh. the most um, insidious things about conservative Christianity is how it teaches you to hate yourself and doubt yourself and doubt your doubts. It's like it's got built in gaslighting. Um, but I couldn't suppress them entirely and it really became a bigger thing when i was about 16 years old but i would say that certain things may have to use christianese planted seeds there because while i did live almost entirely in an evangelical world that was my social world church and christian school mm. i did have some secular literature you know i had like ranger rick magazine yes. by the national wildlife federation that my grandma subscribed me to i read like normal people novels, like, you know, the Ramona novels and stuff, and Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. And um, so I had, like, a bit of a peek into, like, other secular culture, I guess. But um, my crisis of faith started when I was about 16 years old. It became really severe in conjunction with these doubts that I was having when I read through the entire Bible for the first time. Um, and this was right around the time when I was taking Mr. Terry's classes as well um, and having that, those <laughs> thoughts about the rapture. Right. But yeah, so um, I read through the entire Bible for the first time, and then there were a lot of things that I couldn't make sense of. Like, how could God not even just, like, approve of, but command the ancient Israelites to commit genocide? That was horrifying. Mm -hmm. But then there were all these sort of things that just seemed contradictory, like they couldn't totally hold together, whether that's, um, you know, some more serious substantive concerns about predestination and free will, for example, mm -hmm. or um, whether that's, like, 
when they talk about the same battles and chronicles and kings, they give different numbers. Right, right, right. definitely, yeah. Which people, which people who support inerrancy usually explain that in a way by saying, well, like in the original manuscripts, which no one has ever seen, they would obviously be the same. Right, you right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. Um, but the other ones are a little bit more difficult to explain away. So uh, when I was about 16 years old, I was wrestling with these doubts, and I went and talked to our pastor at that time, who uh, was the pastor at River Oaks Community Church in Carmel, Indiana, um, and he lived in our neighborhood. So I went to his house and just sort of like had a kind of counseling session with him. And he seemed sympathetic at first, and he uh, kind of gave me the sense that like it's okay to have doubts and it's okay to wrestle with this. And then he gave me an apologetics book to read, and I can't remember which one. It was in question and answer format. It wasn't one of the really famous ones. Like it wasn't Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel or anything like okay. that. Um, and I read, I read it through, and I mean, it was, I guess it was partly designed to address these questions of contradictions in the Bible, and I just didn't really find it intellectually satisfying. I didn't feel right. like it really addressed my questions in a substantive way, so I went back and said I was still having doubts. And then the spiritual abuse started. The problem was with me. Uh-huh. Somehow, Shit. I was not able to read the Bible in the Holy Spirit. I must be, this is what he literally exactly said. He said, I must be harboring sin in my life. I was allowing demons, literal demons, to influence me. Um, okay, yeah, 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 of course. I mean, what else? Yeah. What other explanation could there be? I offered you a perfectly reasonable explanation for <laughs> the entire Bible and Christian faith, and you're rejecting it, right? Right. When you're <laughs> it stuck must in that be world, demons. Like, you, you take you take it seriously. And another thing that I was afraid of around that time was committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which I actually thought I did for like about a week. At some point in high school, I had this palpable oh, no. anxiety. The in unforgivable my chest. sin. Yes, I had committed it because I'd promised God to stop masturbating and then I masturbated. Oh Chris. no. Chris, you poor you <laughs> poor young person. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just I was in a pretty severe crisis of faith right. at that and yet, I still did two short-term evangelical mission trips to Russia in 1999 and okay. 2000. Yeah, yeah. To make up for after. it. <laughs> well, I was kind of hoping it that, was like, too late. It would, it would renew my faith, right? right that like right, right. It turn me back on fire for God. I would rededicate my life for like the 27th time, probably. Sure. I don't sure, know sure. How many times I rededicated my life? Like the whole thing is so abusive, right? I would go up to the altar calls and cry. Like in high school, that happened so often. Um, so, yeah, I got into college, and I was still dealing with this, and so my college experience, even though I went to a secular university, I went to a state school, Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, I had a good experience there in many ways, but I was dealing with these existential crises that simply do not need to exist, that only exist if you grow up indoctrinated in these horrible ideas. Right, right. Exactly. yeah, definitely. Exactly. And, you know, and, and for those of us who grew up with, like, Christian school or homeschooling for ideological reasons in the 1980s, I think, it was very intense. We were also mobilized for Christian right politics. Uh-huh. There was a lot, of, uh, a lot of responsibility placed on our shoulders to take back this country for Christ. You know, now I Right, you need to, like, to, run for Senate or whatever. Is that what yeah, it's like for you, Chuck? People who grew up, who grew up like oh, that yeah. as generation culture wars. You know, right. we were generation culture wars. We were... Uh, without our consent, because how could a child give it anyway, subjected to a massive experiment in social engineering right. by, our, by our parents and authority figures. And the ex-evangelical movement is really about talking back and saying, that was wrong. You know, you really mm. fucked us up and you have to own it. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah. we're switching sides in the culture wars now. Um, right. <laughs> Which is necessary. <laughs> so I mean, the- that's, this is, that's, like, that's monumentally important for we are the politics of our country kids. right now, right? Like we need, yeah. the, we need a shift, right? Because right now we're literally sitting on this like 50-50 nonsense and we have been for, you know, 20, 20 plus years at this point. And yeah, and people are publishing like 20 think pieces a day about like, oh my God, how can evangelicals possibly vote for Trump? Hey, if you want to know, maybe you should ask people who lived it and left Right, it. yeah, yeah. It's like, the, it's yeah, the left is so question. shocked. And for us, it's, it's like, no, I know. Question. Like, I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Totally. So that's part of why like, I advocate so much now for the amplification of ex-evangelical voices Good. in the public sphere. Yeah. And yet the mainstream news, newspapers and magazines like Washington Post, New York Times, Atlantic still allowed, allow evangelicals 
and like the the people who have the most moderate reputation among them, even though they're not really moderates at all, like Russell Moore and Albert Mueller and whoever, you know, to to largely control their own narrative. Right. And what we need to do is is somehow get that kind of media presence for ex-evangelicals so that we can start to counterbalance and change the story because the story that they tell about themselves is, um, you know, self-aggrandizing and distorted. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it start, it's starting to work. I mean, you, you introduced me as this, um, you know, you quoted Sarah Posner from that article that she published on Splinter News where she called me like an elder statesman of the online ex evangelical right. community. Badass name, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I want mother, to know mother of dragons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, breaker of chains, I think. It was part of it. <laughs> you may call me Khaleesi if you want. Right, no, Khaleesi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, so I'm really happy that she she covered that, and I advocate for more news coverage. But anyway, in terms of my my own um, deconstruction leading up to this point, where I've really tried to bring us together as a community, and also as that community to help amplify our voices. So there's a lot of great memoirs, right, that have been published by individuals. Yeah, and there's okay. a, lot of, a lot of great podcasts. Um, I want them to not be voices crying in the wilderness. So we really need a kind of community presence and visibility right. in order to get the coverage. But anyway, so back to my deconstruction. Um, college, I, uh, there came a moment where I was studying abroad in Germany. It was my third year of college. I spent it in Germany and England and traveling in Russia a little bit with a friend in between. Um, I remember that I was taking a train somewhere. And this is going to sound kind of cheesy because, you know, this is like, what someone who's 21 years old would would write, you know. I, I finally realized for the first time why John Lennon wanted to imagine there's no religion. I wrote, I wrote in uh -huh. my journal. Oh, yeah, 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 totally. That's a huge kind of, line. That's like a huge, that's a huge uh, pop culture t uh, turning point, I think, is that line, right? I went to, a, I went to my friend's uh, Baptist church. My friend's dad was a, was a Baptist pastor, and then the one time that I visited his church, which is a very uh, conservative church in the suburbs here in St. Louis, uh, he he preached an entire sermon on, uh, based on that song, um, wow. and and he sort of ended on the uh, on how bad it would be if there was no religion. And I was sitting there, <laughs> imagine as no a, more sermon, right? Yeah, exactly. I was sitting there, <laughs> and I was uh, I was pretty left. <laughs> <laughs> I was a pretty left Christian at that point, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, I don't know if I disagree with John Lennon in this context, you know. And I was still, I was still Christian, uh, mm -hmm. and just, and just thinking, like, man, this is a, a culturally important, uh, like, like curve, right? You know, and for yeah, him to boldly yeah. say that in a in a pop culture sort of context. Well, speaking of boldly, I mean, basically, that's the idea of Star Trek: Next Generation and all these other things. Right, is, right, yeah, totally. It's like mm. imagining that sort of society where there isn't, you know, these hangs up hang ups on far right ideology and bullshit. You right. Know? Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so I came to this kind of moment of clarity, and when I came back from study abroad, and I met like one of my old friends from my Christian school. I kind of like, I started sort of feeling people out. Like I had to admit to her that I wasn't really evangelical anymore. I was still trying to be Christian and I was trying to be quiet about it. And I felt bad. I felt like a traitor to my family. I felt like I didn't want to offend people. And I, so I told this one friend that like, I'm not really evangelical anymore. She didn't really respond very well to that. Um, I definitely couldn't support inerrancy. I couldn't support young earth creationism anymore. Uh -huh, I'm very yeah. embarrassed now that in college I had arguments with people trying to defend young earth creationism. Oh God. Oh, it's so <laughs> rough, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah it's all right. Same. We all have this. Uh, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so at that point it still was kind of long and dragged out for me because that's how I tend to do things. Unfortunately. Um, I, I, I started speaking out more, some when I was in grad school and I was studying for my PhD at Stanford from 2005 and I graduated in 2012. And so I was in California during the Prop 8 campaign and I was vocally oh, opposed, yeah. to, opposed to Prop 8. Mm -hmm. And um, people saw that, people from my past saw that on social media. Oh, yeah. Um, but I didn't really, I would still kind of take things, not my actual position on something like that. I wouldn't take that back, but like, when I called Christian schools extremists on Facebook and my mom saw it, and my mom still teaches at the Christian school that I graduated from, Heritage Christian School in Indianapolis, uh -huh. 
Um, and she was so upset and I'm attacking everything we stand for. And then I'd be like, I'd cry and I'd be like, mom, okay, I need Jesus. You know? <laughs> oh no. Okay. <laughs> That's hard. Uh, yeah. just, to, just to clarify for anybody that doesn't know in our audience, uh, uh, Prop 8 in California was one of the first bills, uh, one of the first major bills in the United States that would have legalized gay marriage. And it was shot down by California. And what, what was that? 2004 or five or something like that. Wait, no, Prop 8 was to, uh, to ban same-sex marriage after, oh, it had been, after it had been legalized by the okay, court. Okay, it was okay, a referendum. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the right vote on Prop 8 was the no vote. Okay, okay, it was I yes, get you. It was, it was okay. yes, it passed. I, I Chuck was it. homeschooled. I flipped it in my brain. <laughs> my brain flipped it. I was. What, Chris, I've got a question. What did Christianity look There's, like when you studied abroad? Like, wh- were you exposed to, like, is there evangelicalism in Europe, or what does it even look like outside of America? Well, most people in Germany, when they use the word evangelical, they just... Germany, basically, um, the, the Christians are divided between the evangelicals, which basically means Lutherans, and the okay. Catholics, okay. Um, okay. For, the, for, the, for the most part. But there are like some people who are more evangelical in our sense of the word. It's a small number of people. Um, and I met a few of them, and they do tend to be pretty conservative, but they're not that prominent. Now, you might be surprised, though. I mean, um, German Catholics and Protestants can be conservative about some things. I mean, Angela Merkel only came around recently to say that people can vote their conscience on same-sex marriage, right? So... Germany had a kind of second tier civil union until just now, really, like very, okay. very, very, very recent, okay. recently. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize and, that. Yeah. It, did, it, did pass, it, it did pass. In it did pass. It did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Angela Merkel had stood in the way for a while because, um, you know, with the party discipline and the parliament, uh, parliamentary system, like she would not allow Christian Democrats to vote uh, vote against the, the um, Christian Democrat line. And now she said, okay, vote your conscience. So they did. And, so um, there was something about uh, there was something about European culture. And actually, this is something I relate to. I took a trip to Europe, a, a two-week trip. And when I got back, uh, it was like a, another two or three weeks of, of sort of processing what I experienced in Europe. And I, I sort of – that was the point where I felt safe saying like, oh, I'm not a Christian anymore. Uh, Interesting. What, what do you think it was? You did some deconstruction in Europe. Was it was it anything in particular about European culture that that sort of spurred that? Do you feel? Um, maybe. I mean, maybe it's it's seeing different ways that people live. That that's a big part of it. But I think it's also distance that allows you to have some time to uh, to reflect. Ooh, yes. You yes. know. Right. And, and it, yeah, yeah. And it, inter- it interrupts your, well. your routine, and maybe you don't go to church. Like I didn't go to church much when I was there. So um, when you get out of the habit of going to church, that also kind of shifts your perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, anyway, I still I, I came back and I tried really hard. I even tried to do evangelical churches for a long time after that because um, the way that I internalized. <laughs> evangelicalism like i became a people pleaser and a perfectionist and i did not want to offend people right and it took me a long time to get to the point where i feel like okay sometimes in order to be good you have to not be nice like sometimes you have to yeah, yeah work okay, to, yeah. Limit, to limit your empathy good is different towards than people nice is different than good yeah that's but right evangelicalism te- teaches us basically to be nice mm-hmm. except for you know the people who aren't who you know are not nice for God, um, <laughs> like gays. <laughs> hey, but, <laughs> watch you're not nice. You're not no, nice I mean, for God. No, not no, nice. Not like, nice. No, no, no. I mean, I mean, like the like the Mark Driscolls of the world who like get to oh, be assholes. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So I mean, there's a thing like you know, um, gays like a different type of asshole. That's a different straight. Yeah. <laughs> straight. <laughs> like straight <laughs> men in, in, in evangelical world. Uh, have all the power and some of them are huge assholes although some of the evangelical women can be very in your face too right Um, yeah yeah. so but they're also i mean evangelicals are kind of afraid of conflict among themselves like they're so stressed that everyone has to believe all the exact same things like you have to be right that's the only way you get to heaven um so i you know came out of that not good at doing conflict or confrontation with people at all um, and so these are things that you have to learn, um, how to actually confront people, how to handle conflict, how to set boundaries. Um, and it's not, it's not easy. So it was a very long drawn out 
process for me. And in part of that process too, like I eventually uh, realized that some, some things about myself that I just, I couldn't see before and was probably suppressing that, um, but that probably had an influence on the whole process, which is that I'm queer. Um, like a couple of years ago, I had a crush on a male friend for the first time and it was a really profound moment for me. Yeah, yeah. But before that, I already started thinking more about gender and um, gender nonconformity and re- just kind of, kind of really reflected on how, yeah, I, masculinity as we understood it or, you know, never made a lot of sense to me. And growing uh-huh. up, I wasn't really interested in doing the things that like all the men in the family did, like the men played things. basketball and watched golf on TV. And, you know, not that those things, like you have to do those things to be a man. Right. But that, that was the, that was the masculine socialization or the male socialization right. in my environment. And I was like, that's boring. I want to go do something <laughs> else. You know? Right. Right. Also, so, is, is there something wrong with me or like, am I fine? Yeah. Right. Right. So like, and people would kind of pick up on this and would sort of like tease me about how I, um, you know, did not match masculine archetypes or stereotypes. Like there was one guy in school who would like, I don't know why if he, he was one of the popular guys and I don't even know why he asked me this question in the first place. Maybe he, wanted to find a reason to tease me, but I think he kind of liked me. I mean, he wasn't that, he wasn't too mean or anything, but he was, <laughs> he was like, what's some of your favorite music? So I said, Alanis Morissette, and he thought that was the funniest thing in the world. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he would keep asking me once in a while, you still Did like he, Alanis Would you Morissette? say that he thought it was ironic? Ha! <laughs> Get out. I had a Chris, I had a youth <laughs> pastor who made me watch all of the Rocky movies to try to make me more masculine. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. It actually kind of worked. It worked for a while. <laughs> um, so, yeah, people would sometimes, I would, like, press, press this a little bit, and so you get to this point in a conversation, and I would just say, well, but I'm comfortable in my masculinity. But that uh-huh. meant precisely one thing, which was that I like girls, you know, right, which was true. Right, right, right. Like, I, I have always been attracted to women, so it wasn't a lie or anything. Uh-huh. And I think that because of that, too, like, I never had to investigate that maybe I could be attracted to men. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But eventually but you, you, you were comfortable doing that. Uh, like, and, I've, and I'd still like, I find myself um, attracted to women more often than men, but now I know that I can be attracted to men and it's interesting, you know? And I've never had like a problem of being like, well, that guy's really cute or whatever. You uh-huh. know? That's huge. Uh, I mean, I kind of went through a situation like that as well where I realized more, mine was more retrospect where I realized, oh, I was attracted to this person in the past, you know, mm-hmm. and that was kind of like my first introduction to that. But it started to really, it changes a lot of things, changes your your perspective. Yeah. And- I mean, I can think of one of one moment in my early teenage years where I don't know how much detail I should go into about this, but that like in retrospect... I think it was a homoerotic moment in a certain way. Yes. And, um, and I remember just feeling deep shame afterwards. Yeah, right, and right. like, I cried a bunch and I did not, but I, anyway, I probably Confusing shouldn't say as fuck, isn't it? That. Yeah. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say anything more about it on the record. Uh, I completely <laughs> right, understand. Right. I, had a, I had a situation <laughs> but, like that well. Yeah, there was, yeah, yeah, yeah. In in retrospect, there was something there that you were, you weren't really allowed to to process or access. Right, right? So yeah. I didn't. Right, yeah, so yeah. yeah. Uh, um, Chris, we we are uh, pushing our our time limits here, so uh, we should probably wrap up. Um, where can our listeners find you? Right. Um, so my blog is called Not Your Mission Field, and you can find it at chrisdroop.com, or if you go to notyourmissionfield.com, it also redirects to the same place. Okay, so um, that's uh, C-H-R-I-S-S-T-R-O-O-P. Yeah, Chris that's Stroop. correct. Yeah. And on Twitter, my handle is uh, at C underscore Stroop. Okay, cool. Um, so I do, and, and uh, the life after follows you, so you can you can find us via vis a vis that if you need to. Yeah, so that would get you pretty well plugged in. I write for a variety of outlets sometimes, besides my own website. Okay. Uh, most re- most frequently, religion dispatches. So, and to be clear, uh, you did write a series of post apocalyptic sci fi novels uh, <laughs> during your time well, you in, in Corpus Christi, right? <laughs> uh yeah no um so like yes i google myself i am that vain and um unfortunately there is a 
Well, I don't want to say, unfortunately, that's not really fair to him, but there is another, <laughs> there is another right. Christopher Stroop that people could confuse with me, possibly, who is from Corpus Christi, Texas, and played a bit part in Pearl Harbor and self-published these uh, science fiction novels on Amazon.com, and I'm always afraid that people are going to think I wrote them. <laughs> and, uh, Chris, One really of them quick. is called End Times War, so it doesn't sound <laughs> that far <laughs> Doesn't sound too far fetched. <laughs> it's it's probably your, your old uh, AP biology teacher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, he just thought you had a cool name. Uh, and you are also yeah. associated with, uh, I, I can't officially call them our sister podcast, but a very similar podcast that. Uh, we that we love. get along with very well. Very well. <laughs> We're so, sisters. What podcast is that? I think you're thinking of Exvangelical. Yeah. There yes. we go. Exvangelical. I have been on Exvangelical twice. Blake Chastain is a Ooh, great guy. It's a, right. it, it's a, it's a great We're podcast. Very cool. For Exvangelicals. Um, and I've done some radio spots. I mean, I've also done some comments on the Rick Smith show. And once I went on state of belief radio with welton gaddy and um so yeah if you if you prefer the listening format i've got a few things out there too cool. sweet very good chris thank you so much for joining us today uh we had a great time hearing your stories and i think that our listeners are really going to get a lot of good insight thank you definitely thanks chris. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me brady and chuck it's been it's been great i, I really appreciate you guys so thanks awesome uh thank you everybody for listening uh this has been yet another episode of the life after good night john boy (laughs) good night john boy no 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 do it do your shout out i love it and remember Uh, john boy is brady by the way we're gonna start calling him john Boy. really what what is john boy i don't understand this and thank you everybody good night and remember uh if you don't go to church sunday is just another another saturday saturday (laughs) thank you